Hi, you're listening to She Shield, your one-stop pod for all topics personal safety. I'm your host, Sophia, and my goal is to help educate women and men on concealed carry, martial arts, and all topics self-defense. Before we start today, please take a moment to rate this podcast. If you are a patron of the podcast, you've listened to a few episodes already. If you have time to give honest feedback, it just takes a few seconds. Head up there and give it a star rating. I know right now we have 45 five-star ratings on Spotify. That's where I listen the most, and I just could be more thankful for you all taking a couple seconds out of your day to support us. This episode is sponsored by Big Tech's Ordnance, your soon-to-be favorite retailer for all of your firearms needs. BTO believes in only selling high-quality gear for responsibly armed citizens, as well as providing pre- and post-sale support. BTO values firearms training and supports firearms instructors nationwide. They even pay for their own staff to train with high-level instructors to ensure that when you as the consumer reach out, you are taken care of. Today we have John Valentine back on the show. This is going to be such a lovely episode. I can just tell already. We had an awesome pre-show chat, um, especially about the Combatives Association Summit coming back up this year, 2024. I'm so excited to go again. Uh, But before we start that, John, I would love for you to reintroduce yourself to the listeners. Hey, what's going on, guys? So, uh, Sophia, thanks again for having me back on. I, I, you know, it's always a good time having t- having conversations with uh, you know, like minded folks. Uh, yeah. So my my bio is very simple: martial artist, uh, long time military, almost two decades of service, uh, jiu jitsu black belt, and combatives instructor, um, live fire martial artist. I love it. Live fire martial artist, very cool. And what is your background with training from? the civilian side and then law enforcement side, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah. So I've, uh, I've been a combatives instructor since 2007. Uh, I was started there. I, I, you always start teaching people whenever you become a, a non-commissioned officer in the army. So I've been training folks are responsible for training people and, and, and leading them since, uh, 2005, uh, became my, got my first instructor certification in 2007. And, uh, at that same time, I also started training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu actively. Like the, the first core group of people that I had to train was like the personal security detail for my brigade commander. So that, so that was like kind of a very, uh, a demanding audience. So it, it just really inspired me to go and dive into all the material that I can get. And, and I just got very serious about it. And I, I realized, um, that the event or the, the, the paper that came with being an instructor, it came with, um, heavy burden, uh, a constant burden of responsibility and readiness. And so it, it's just something like, I just followed that path of where it took me. And uh, I can't believe where I'm at right now. And uh, I'm really excited to see. Uh, I, I totally underestimated where the next 10 years would take me. And like, I, I'm really, I'm really excited to see what the next 10 years brings. Absolutely. And something I particularly like about you, John, is that you saw a need in the industry and we're going to talk about that today the the need that I'm talking about and you took action to fill it and you're continually filling it um I was honestly so impressed by the turnout of the first the first combatives association summit the first summit uh so many people there ready to train everyone everyone there took it seriously but also were they're also open to discussion it wasn't like this like, if you're not at this level, you can't be here. I mean, your promotions for the event even say you don't need to have experience. And I agree with that. I've had some people DM me and say, like, hey, what level do I need to be at to attend this event? And I've told them, you don't need to be at any level. This is a great introductory even course for people who don't know what they need to work on so they can learn what they need to work on in these little workshops and then, like, be empowered to move on from there. Um so since we're on the topic, I would love for you to explain the layout of the summit so that people can know. And then I'm really excited for today's topic. This is something that doesn't get a lot of exposure on this podcast. So if you've listened for some time, um, definitely stick around. I'm really excited. We didn't even plan some of these topics, but during our pre-show chat, I was like, dude, we have to get into this stuff. So anyway, back to the question. How does CAS work? So Combat Association is, uh, or the summit is, is kind of an event that I would wanted to go to and, or just really wish was around when I first started getting into concealed carry. And I I got into this as a purple belt in jujitsu. And 
I, I didn't do a lot of like door kicking stuff. I mean, I, I had a lot of students that do really cool stuff, but I personally, like my job wasn't um, an operational operational function. It was more like an operational support. So, but that gave me exposure to see what it was like when people got shot at, when they got blown up. So uh, I just realized that, or I knew that itty bitty bullets don't turn people to dust. It doesn't make them go away. So one of the first questions I asked my uh, instructor when I got my, my permit was like, Hey, what does it look like to get into a fight and I'm armed? Uh, because I, you know, after what you just told me this, 16 hour course you just told me i just can't like if somebody just comes up and slap me i can't just drug and burn them down so so i asked him like but i understood the liability that came with like getting into a fight guns get loose all these things so um i was like I, trying to figure out there was like a concealed carry combatives course that was kind of the question i asked and um he didn't know any uh, of of one he just kind of gave me the best answer he had at the time and it just didn't satisfy um my curiosity so from there, um, I just started to look up and I found Matt Larson uh, online and I just I'd been living in North Virginia at the time and I was like 20 minutes from his gym and started training with Matt and everything just kind of snowballed. And the other thing I saw was like just looking at this stuff on social media. It was just like if you look up hashtag combatives, it's just like a bunch of really awful kung fu with like maybe a knife or a gun thrown in and it's just like combatives and or, or something crazy where it's like if the person touches your shoulder ever so gently you just pull your knife out and place like just kind of crazy stuff that'll like send you to yeah. jail forever um so it was so it was like okay this is not practical at all or or they just really overcomplicated it to where it's like you had to get this very very specific angle with this very so it was just very very silly stuff and it was nothing i experienced with fighting at all or silly you know platitudes like hey you're gonna if you get into a knife fight you're gonna get cut well i've been in kind of all kinds of fights and every single one of them i took damage it's just like there so it's like almost an implying that well, if I get into a fight, there's a way for me to fight where I don't take damage, right? And that's just not the case. It's it's just not a, it's not authentic. And that was really the that's really what I started to really find. Well, like what was what is authentic? What is real? And how do I personally get the experience I need to where I'm able to drive my training in a direction that makes sense and that's practical in in a way that it's it's solving my real problem that I'm gonna that I'm gonna have in a self defense situation, and a lot of people really didn't have that answer. Most of the time, what happens is people will go to a martial artist, and what happens is they teach you their martial art. And I started to realize that every martial art is essentially a tactic for fighting, really a depth of exploration in a specific tactic for fighting, and so. Like most young men, my first my first martial art was boxing, and that's because my tactic for a fight was punch somebody repeatedly until they could not fight back effectively. So I so I got I found a martial art that helped me get better at executing that plan, and then I discovered grappling, which is like if somebody has the boxing plan, they're going to be in big trouble. And it's not that boxing is a BS martial art; it's just like there isn't a double leg takedown defense in boxing. So. So again, right? So the grappling is a tactic. The striking is a tactic. Then with self-defense, we started realizing like using language is a tactic. Using a pistol is a tactic. Same way using a knife. It's just there, there, there's a taking the martial arts and then adapting them to provide real solutions was not something I really found a lot of. And so we created this, uh, you know, group of friends of mine, me, Cliff Byer Lee, Redbeard Combatives, Ben Albin, Matt Larson. Uh, we started a Facebook group just because we were just tired of the nonsense that was out there. So we just started talking about this. And all of a sudden you get like dudes who've been doing this for a long time that I never even heard of. So you have you had Craig Douglas, you had Paul Sharp joining, you had uh, Cecil Birch joining um, and just just really just a long list. Chuck Haggard, this everybody. Right. And um and it just opened my eyes to this world. I didn't even know what was going on. These conversations that were going on about self-defense and it just continued to snowball. And 
and I knew it was a good thing to do because, or I, I, I felt like the confirmation that this was a good, good route to take of taking it to social media was because that there were other people who had the same question and then other, some people who had different answers and it just became this living thing that just kind of took on a life of its own. And now we're at 2024 about to have the second summit. Um, so yeah, excited. Absolutely. Well, I loved hearing the inception story again, pre-show. Um, it just brought me back to why I originally went to the conference and why I believed in it, uh, still believe in it and so on. I love that you all did something. It wasn't just, you know, kind of poo-pooing on, you know, the craziness on social. And I giggled earlier because that's so true. Like, I remember even starting in my Korean traditional style martial arts, you know, someone like grabs your wrist and then you you immediately like you flip them. You know, there's no question. It's just like, I'm going to step under and I'm going to like flip you over my shoulder. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> you counter a grab by like basically like a, almost attempted murder, right? Like yes. what? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And it, if anyone's listening and, and you practice a traditional martial arts, there are so many benefits to it. I mean, you there are so many little things you can take from it, just like anything. But the practicality of it was not there, and that's why I, I started questioning things and um, eventually ended up in a jiu-jitsu gym and then I ended up in Muay Thai because I wanted to learn to use my elbows and knees and stuff like that. So um I love that you know you actually inquired about this stuff and then you took action and here we are today. You put on this event for people who have the same questions. They can show up and kind of get a taste of everything. Um would you mind kind of explaining the the diversity of training that will be there? I know last year I thought that we were <laughs> supposed to bring guns i wrote you and i was that awful student i wrote you like the night before and i was like dude guns right like how much ammo and you're like no like no guns dude so would you <laughs> would you explain that yeah so yeah so that, that so I've, I've taken a lot of courses and one of the hard things about going to courses and all that is just that it's it's so demanding. It's such a huge investment for a lot of reasons because you got to go to generally you go to a place that's very remote, um, so there's not a lot to do, not a lot to so you got to bring food with you or anything like that. Um, also, because all the investment that goes as far as getting there, paying for equipment, all that stuff. So like now you're essentially dipping into a competing between vacationing with your family and then also meeting your obligation as a protector of your family as well. Like those two things are, they're, they're in conflict. So, so there, there was a lot of questions or a lot of problems I was trying to solve because I, I experienced it myself. And one of the things was like, okay, um, let's make it to where there don't need to bring anything. Like you literally don't need to bring anything. You don't need to buy anything. Everything is going to be provided for you. All the training equipment, all the holsters, water, notebooks, towel, all that stuff. We even make sure to send an email to remind people to put on deodorant and trim their nails and all that stuff. So, um, yes. yeah. Right. So again, right. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, 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 so all those things, right. To pr make it to be a, a comfortable experience. Right. And the other thing is that we are actually holding our event indoors in, in, a, inside in a venue where it's a really nice place, really great weather, but you're also going to be indoors. You're going to have AC. You're going to be padded, padded mats and all that stuff. So as far as like your training and your exposure, it's going to be entirely very, very, very comfortable. Um, the other side is that it's the location, Doberville, Mississippi. I mean, Biloxi, Mississippi. It's kind of a hidden gem. Um, the hotels there really give like a, there's a lot of casinos there. So it's like, you have this like Vegas vacation vibe and it's right on the Gulf coast. So it's a beautiful area. Um, and of course it's in, in Mississippi, deep South. So the people are friendly. Um, and so there's a lot for you to do. There's things for your family to do. And then you can go train during the day and then party at night and go, go or get some nice dinner or something like that. You know? So um, it, it, the event is not going to be like, I, I wanted something, um, 
me and the guys are talking about it. Like, you know, all those guys, they're, they're good at managing a pace of a class. So it's not going to be like super demanding physically. You're not going to have like it. It's not a three day coliseum, guys. Like it's meant for anybody of any level, any age to come by, learn something, have a good time, and just come in. And just you just show up, and essentially all the stuff is provided for you. Everything has been walked through from like a student perspective to where, as a student, I get everything I need to learn what I'm going to learn. I get to learn from professionals at a pace that is suitable for me, and I actually get to solve my problem now. The one thing that people really ask of like getting like a course certificate or something like that, you'll you'll get a, a training certificate, but the the summit is not necessarily a course. It, it's like it, it's more like tapas, right? It's like it's like a sampler plate of like all this different body of work. What does it look like to defend against a knife? Uh, what does it look like to use language to defend yourself? What does it look like to fight for a gun over a gun? Um, what does it look like? Uh, uh, what? Uh, talking about building warrior ethos um you know because that's that's one thing that combatives does that like a lot of shooting courses won't really do it doesn't really it doesn't bring you closer to like who you really want to be right and then like you get to train and like you get to discover who you really are and it puts you on a process to like okay i need to go do x so it's really if if anything it's it's probably the best compass you're gonna get as far as like your capability and your needs, um, your strengths and weaknesses is in terms of your self-defense training. I love that. Absolutely. I've heard people say in the past, like, you know, about these types of events, right? Um, I know like there are a few other events like this going on around the same time where they're kind of workshop classes and it's like, how much can I really get? And it's like, if you apply yourself and, uh, take notes, especially after the class, like take notes on what you learned, give yourself practice points for later on, and then also take it for what it is. It's an opportunity to see where your gaps of knowledge are so that you can then fill them and then ask questions to these instructors who are just so open to, you know, answering. They're there for that reason. It's all an incredibly positive opportunity. Um, that is something I wish I did more last year. I I think I I was so just in the moment. I wanted to just be in the moment, but I do wish that I'd taken more notes um, on what to work on because back home now, I have a training partner who um, she doesn't carry concealed. She doesn't even own a firearm, but she's decided to uh, just be an incredible friend slash training partner. And she's curious about the stuff. So every now and then I'll throw on my Filster Enigma with my blue gun and we'll do some grappling and I'll just kind of stand there sometimes. I'm like, shit, I like don't, I don't remember. So this year I'm excited to be more intentional with just taking a few drills home that I can then practice. Um, and then that way I can think of more holes like, okay, well, you know, she did this weird move or like, I didn't know what to do from there. So then I can inquire about that and just build on that. So um, if you're listening and you're hesitant on that aspect, it's actually like a perfect amount of, training for that time and then you get to meet these instructors and their resources for you you can then they have some basis of knowledge of where you're at you can then reach out and ask questions about um, those little training things that come up where you're like i had no idea how to get out of this or you know i didn't know what to do from here so thank you for sharing that that's so lovely the other thing too is like you, you have the facebook group as a resource i mean so uh we're, we're trying to transition to live fire app to put it there just because that way we're not limited by the the meta gods as far as like you, <laughs> you, you thou shalt not want to value thy life and you know, stuff like that so we're trying to get past meta um so but the, you know like i'm there i'm pretty easy to get a hold of I, I don't have a million followers so generally like if you're talking to me it's gonna be me um you know everybody had my cell phone number so if you guys have questions and all that like you know the facebook group is there and like not just the instructor team from cast but also like a lot of really good serious students guys that are um high level instructors or high level practitioners themselves like real serious end users there so there's a there's a high uh high signal to noise ratio there in, in that group and and we we generally keep away the uh, the, the seafoods of the world. So <laughs> it's a, 
So yeah, that's always a good resource too. Like, <laughs> got that. So, <laughs> like so, master sifu. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> All the grand dragons that just can't be taught anything else. So yeah, guys. So um, yeah, it. So yes. we're all really approachable guys. All of us. Um, that like, I think this material has a way of humbling you in a way that shooting doesn't, because it's like you kind of truly understand what your efficacy is in a, in a real time way, in a real tangible way, because it's like the, the sim rounds and the marking cartridges don't really lie or, or the drills don't really lie. So kind of people realize is like who, who they are and everybody's, I think that's part of why, you know, the conference, like it was such a, it was such a cool vibe, you know, like everybody was there. We were all training. Yeah. But we like even the conversations there and just the relationships built, like it was, um, for me, it was like worth the price of admission. So it was, um, I I don't know. Like I'm biased, but I think it's just one. It's just like one of the best events that I've I've ever been to. Absolutely, totally fair to be biased. Also, totally fair to acknowledge that you've done your research, and you also work with these men. It's not like you just tell them what to do. I mean, you get feedback from them. You've taken their classes. You've trained with them. They've trained with you. I mean, you have a very good idea of what's going on. And now you have the first summit under your belt. Um, is there anything different about the second summit than the first? Or is it pretty much the same flow? Yeah, I mean, we, so we had the venue change from last year. Um, that was the main thing. And we have some instructor changes. Uh, so we're not going to have a, a ton of CQB because of the venue change. So we don't really have like the... The, the proper facilities to have that right um uh so and then also chet you know um chet is he's uh he's winning his fight against cancer right now so he's not going to be instructing uh shout out to him god bless him uh we also have uh so some other instructors come in we have carrie murakami who's like a retired chicago land cop jiu-jitsu black belt you know awesome dude he's got a uh, material on on fighting for a pistol coming up the we have uh, Tom Carter from Sayoc Ta Sayoc Tactical Group. He's going to come out, and or or somebody from Sayoc Tactical Group um, is going to be coming out and showing us some of the knife work. So we have like some offensive knife work happening. Um, the the main thing is like to look at it as um, we don't want to be like the like there was a lot of jujitsu black belts last year, but we're agnostic to jujitsu. We don't really like if anything jujitsu is a is adaptive for us. We use it as an adaptive martial art to solve the problem. Um, we're not necessarily trying to push jujitsu onto people. And that's kind of the main thing with all the instructors is, um, is just being martial agnostic brand agnostic and just looking at the problem of self-defense solving at solving it. And because there's multiple ways to solve any problem, everybody's kind of presenting their ways and the, and their body of work and what they've done, what they've done, how they've done it and why they do it. Right. Absolutely. Would you be willing to explain that a little bit more to someone who maybe doesn't have so much jujitsu experience? I know a, a big question from my buddies who kind of get what I do. I have a lot of friends in medical school because, you know, I was in medical school, I quit and they really, I love them so much. They really try to understand what I do and they'll be like, wait, so how does gi jiu-jitsu apply if you're technically supposed to grab the garment and you don't have the garment? Like they ask these really good questions. So would you kind of delve into that a little bit deeper for those listening that don't understand that? So, so yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the main thing with the garment and the gi is just that we need something robust and strong so we can keep training, right? <laughs> it's like we don't want to be training in our t-shirts that are, you know, this thin that tear up. So that's kind of one of the main things. But the, the other side of that, as far as the, the adaptive approach is just, okay, what does the end state in jiu-jitsu look like? And it looks like getting a submission or getting dominant position, right? That's kind of dominant position being secondary, maintaining control. Um, but in a, self-defense situation for us like what does winning look like and it doesn't look like a jiu-jitsu match it doesn't look like and a lot of times it can come down to saying the right thing and not letting the fight go go anywhere um but the other side about that is like knowing what to say or knowing how to speak 
like I still need that other person to agree with like they don't want this problem and I don't want this problem and we kind of go both separate ways. So really the desired end state for a self-defense situation is going home and going back to peaceful living. That's kind of what that is. Um, but sometimes people are adamant on making sure that that doesn't happen. So they'll generally like in real fights, there's kind of three things. There's, there's gra there's, there's grappling because they grab you or they try to control you. They don't want you to go somewhere. They, they want to take something from you or maybe they want to take you. Um, so there's grappling. And because at the ranges that grappling happens, there's, there's strikes involved. So people will hit, you know, you can, you can hit somebody there at the same rate you grab them. And then there's weapons involved because it, unlike a martial arts mat room or anything like that, it's not a sanitized environment. Even so, like even the ground is an omnipresent impact weapon. If we fall or anything like that, there's walls and structures and everything. So that's how this stuff applies because the main thing is like with jujitsu is that we can also use it in reverse. It doesn't have to be of like, I am going to push this to go to the ground. I can also make sure that I don't fall. I don't end up on the ground or I can use it to make sure that they can't, if they grab me, they can't hold me. So that's, that's what I mean by like the adaptive approach. I know, I understand what it takes to control somebody. So I'm able to counter pretty easily uh, anybody trying to control me because of that. Answer your question. Absolutely. Yes, you did. Uh, there's actually like this huge shadow on me from my mic. So I'm like having to turn it. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. But <laughs> I just realized that I was like, what is that shadow? Um, I promise I was paying attention. No, I appreciate you explaining that. I got so much from that. Even not that I don't have more to learn, of course. Um, but even as someone who I feel like has a pretty good idea of where does it who fits into this space. The way you just articulated that was so helpful. Um, and even like ironed out things for myself um, mentally. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I know before this, we talked about an overcomplication of tactics. You went on, I hate to call it a rant, but you kind of, because it wasn't, it was so well articulated. A rant is almost like not fair, uh, but I would love for you to kind of explain to the listener what you explained to me, like what you're observing. Yeah, I, I think um I think what happens a lot in this in this kind of field, um, if you want to call it this study, um, people they're looking mainly to push their martial art on you. They're not really trying to solve the problem. And I, I think in general the uh students deserve more than the instructor's bias. So th this idea of, of me just like I'm, I'm a jujitsu black belt, so I'm going to teach you jujitsu and then basically teach. It's it's like every martial art has its limit. So um, so if that limit, you being unprepared at that limit is catastrophic for the individual. So I, I, that's why it's like they, they've got to get more than my bias and they, I can't push my martial art on them. Um, I got to solve the problem and the way that goes. And um, just generally, like, there's kind of a couple red flags to me that I've seen just because I, I started doing, I got, like, I got a CrossFit level one coaching back in, like, 2010 and led to, like, a whole bunch of other fitness certifications. So I've been dealing with fitness since 2010, martial arts since 07, and then I started with gun stuff in 2012. And so being in these three communities, I kind of found like the red flags and really because most people don't really understand how to hire somebody when they're trying to pay for a course. So it's like, so skills, knowledge, ability. And I think people, when they have, I pretty much it's a hundred percent or there are exceptions to the rule, but it doesn't change the rule. And usually like what I see when people are marketing very heavy science projects or anything like that or very like complicated methods of of uh training it's generally it's kind of a good marker for bs uh, and, and it's like they're like they're this this thing you're doing is so complicated and i've done the research to where i've discovered the secrets and this is the way and i have the right answers i have all the answers these other guys don't and it's like that I haven't had, I haven't created anything like as far as techniques and material, the content wise, I haven't created anything new. 
the human body has been the same for many millions of years and, and fighting is fighting is fighting. Um, even a lot of the ways you look at hierarchy of position in jujitsu, it's the same way of like tactics within an infantry platoon. It's like you, what's better than being uh, on the side? You know what I mean? Being on top, what's better than being on top, being behind them and on top of them. So you can always look at like how it's like, you, you understand what winning looks like. Um, it's very easy to make it simple. And, and that's, that's kind of the way it is. It's like, Fighting is too dynamic and happens too quick to where you need to scroll through this Rolodex of terminology. I need you to understand the overall strategy for what winning looks like, where you can get to a position where you are balancing the scales in your favor, as opposed to like, I'm going to get this end state. And it, the idea isn't really, um, isn't really just doing well. It's just like really mitigating damage, right? Um, and that's really what it is because, you know, you're, you're going to take damage when you get into a fight. And that's kind of like where I focus thinking about things from a principles first perspective. Absolutely. Is there an example you could give the listener like with knife fighting if they haven't seen this, which I see this psh, like a lot on my for you page. I mean, I will see it as like research even if a lot of it's BS, it's almost like I got to see what's like cycling out there. I need to see what my sisters are seeing. You know what I mean? Um, but is there an example that just pops up in your head? Yeah. Like, like there'll be a knife fighter guy and he'll be like, this person does this one move and I'll do seven of them. But, and for some reason, this person was a statue and couldn't counter or do a move back. And it's not usually like that. Like it's always, like if you watch a UFC fight, it's like you see there's like a tit for tat, right? Or maybe a movement and a dodge. Like there's never this whole thing of like this person stands completely still. I cut them up seven different ways and then then they all just fall to the ground into dust or something like that. It's just it, it's it's comical even. It, it, it's almost like but I mean, it would be it would actually be a lot more comical if the guys weren't serious about like, yeah, this is them, you know coming up with a program like uh um it's it's really silly if, if it kind of looks silly and it looks unbelievable that's because it's not real honestly <laughs> absolutely that makes a lot of sense do you think of something else oh man uh f there's a lot there's just so much out like i I get sent videos like on a regular basis now of guys like what is this stuff and like the dude who's using his um human energy to like make the people fall or a guy will he'll grab a, a pressure point and like yes and this pressure a 120 pound woman can control a, a six foot man and like no you can't uh and and here's the other thing too the only people that are buying that are people who really want to buy the lie um i, I did an experiment with my coworker, right and i i i, I did some crazy wrist lock that was not a wrist lock at all. And I was like, yeah, like, like this, I can control it. And she looked at me and she's like, okay. Like, like she, and, and, and the point of that was like that even her not being a fighter, she understood that she was being told some bullshit. And, and I, I would say like, if you feel like what you're being told to is BS, um, and it doesn't look like it will work, um, you, I go with your gut, trust your gut. It, it, your money is, your money is a representation of the time that you will not get back. So like choose wisely. If you're going to hire people, you're going to choose an instructor. Think about like, at least for me, like I, I use a criteria of, of knowledge, skills, and ability. Does this person, is this person have some objective representation that they have the knowledge that they say they have? Like, that's kind of like why the, like I, I jujitsu is not like my whole life. It's just part of what I do. But the idea of being a black belt says at least I have a, I've at least it's like a degree in that I've done a long st study of work and long and it's and also people know jujitsu is not BS. It's like you you have to they don't hand that shit out right. Um. So and same thing with with the college education. So, um. Then it's like then like what's their knowledge like what's their social media look like what do they say and how do they are they actually solving my problem and just because they have some objective standard of knowledge are they actually performing are they actually still training are they going out to matches are they dry firing all these things like um i i think 
I think when, if you don't see instructors like training or refining themselves, or like you just, I, I think it's a red flag for me. For me, it's person per, personally. I, I I think um because I'm constantly improving, I'm constantly getting better. So I I just I, I think I think the students deserve that. For me to at least like find out where my stuff fails. Um, because again, like I, I care about their development, and so maybe there's like hey, this is a limit of my course, so you can continue on by doing this, right? So that's um, that's the way I look at it, is like you got to treat, treat signing up for a class like hiring somebody. Look at their skills, look at their knowledge, look at their ability, and that'll be the best way that, that for you at least, um, that'll be a, make sure you're getting a good return on your investment. And there are a lot of guys out there who have outstanding resumes, and they, so they've got a lot of knowledge, but then... Like if you start really objectively obsessing or assessing the skills and ability side, it's like it's kind of lacking. You could probably get get more from training from Sophia than some of these guys with big resumes. So I love that. Not just because you said my name is an example, but uh, thank you, John, for sharing that. <laughs> um, it's an incredibly valuable uh, kind of list of things to look for when hiring an instructor for yourself. Um, that's a great way to look at it. Lately, I've just been attending courses that have come recommended to me. I haven't felt the need to really vet them because the people that tell me are people like, you know, Chuck Haggard and, um, you know, Riley Bowman, people I respect that, you know, vet these people almost for me. Uh, but for the people that are listening, like the, you know, the average gun owner looking for the next steps, it is incredibly valuable to know what to look for. Uh, I know that, for example, my sister up in Boston, she was like, hey, do you think this person would be good to learn from? And she sent me this range that she, you know, that's, that was near her and they have these instructors listed. The instructors don't have like hardly any information on them. You know, it'll sometimes say like retired police, but you know, that doesn't really tell me anything. So I have to then call and inquire. And, uh, you know, that's for my sister, you know, so why wouldn't I do that for myself? Uh, so thank you for empowering the listeners with not only knowledge, but encouraging them to just do the work. And then it's your time is just taken care of. Yeah. And I think also like um, people get kind of too caught up in the the resume of people where <laughs> They're like, oh, well, I want to go learn somebody who's been to combat. Well, like, that's not going to be what your self-defense situation looks like. Um, that's not, and, and also, regardless of what someone experiences, whether they are the UFC champion, they're the greatest special operator in the world or the greatest SWAT guy ever, there is no one fight to define all of them. Like, it's not like I'm going to like, oh, this one fight – that's the way I'm going to train people forever. It's like every fight is going to be very specific and unique to the individual. So like you, you've got to, there are a core set of skills involved in every fight and you have to figure out or extract those skills, figure out the training methods and the training methods as far as like, okay, what is kind of what's allowed here, right? What What's the, what's the escalation of force here? What's the de-escalation look like? And then you come up and you can you can discover your own techniques as far as what's going to work for you. Like, I will never fight in the dress, but so Sophia might. So she might have to figure out, like, OK, um, what does that look like to, you know, deal with that? Um, and, and then, like, she's got to put herself in that situation. And, and you know what I mean? So there's like so many different individual individual elements. Like, I don't know who's coming to a course. It, I don't. So I can just basically give them the skills that empower them to discover themselves and also makes it to where they don't need me for answers. They can trust their own experience. They can trust their own good judgment as far as what's going to work for them. Absolutely. I love that. Um, the dress is a good example, although thank you for that mental image. And then um, even something like off body carry, if someone came to you and asked you, I can't stop you. <laughs> okay, I'm back. I'm back. 
<laughs> John has had to mute me because my audio is coming through on his side, but we're both cracking up. For those of you that aren't on YouTube watching the um <laughs> the video side of this. Um anyway, yes, thank you for that. But so even if I were to come to you as uh, you know, just someone who's attending the, the summit and said, you know, hey, do you recommend off-body carry? Uh you could recommend an off-body carry course, maybe like Vicky Farnham or something like that. Uh, but then you could also speculate, you know, like fights happen within this distance, within this time. So consider, you know, you're trying to retrieve your firearm from a bag. So these are things to think about. Um, you still have the tools necessary to uh, get that person to think, right, about those tactics. Uh, but you're also being honest that, you know, you don't carry in a, a purse. You don't have you know, personal experience with that. But um, I love that you have the perspective of someone who doesn't want your students uh, to be basically under your bias. You said, my students deserve more than just my bias. And I absolutely love that. That's incredible. Absolutely. Is there anything else that the listener could do to discern between a I hate to say a good and bad instructor because that's so vague. Uh, but like, say I were to call that individual um, at my sister's range um, or call the Jizitsu gym and ask about the the owners and their past. Um, is there anything else you look for, maybe even during your vetting process for your instructors? Um, I think the, the main thing I really look for is just um, making sure that like where their product came from, like what are the origins, right? So like, the interesting thing about all the instructors at the combative summit is not so much of like their material, which is all, all phenomenal stuff, but really each one of them had their own personal need they needed to solve. Nobody was like, okay, let, there's a market demand for this class. So let me go ahead and meet this market demand. And you, you kind of can tell who those people are. And so like, you can act like, I like approachable, I like people where it's like I can ask them a question about what their material looks like and um, and or why they do certain things. And then they have a very thoughtful answer and they can talk about like this and they're not like speaking about it in a way that it's like, oh, well, this only this experience that I had in this one dark night on this one operation or whatever it is that they did. They're like, well, this is the way people work. This is the way they react to this. This is the way this goes down. This is how I've tested this. And this is what I've came away with. At least this is the best I've got right now. And they're constantly, they're still, every instructor I talk to that's really good at what they do and has like stuff that is like, man, I don't know how to improve this. They're still agnostic about themselves and, and agnostic about their material. And they're still trying to look for ways to refine it and make it better. And and it just like that's kind of that's a huge like green flag for me i should i could say um that that's what's going on like they're they're agnostic about who they about themselves they're not really looking at themselves as an authority figure they're looking at themselves as facilitating a solution to a problem that that um that they've experienced and then you've got a good question and they've got a great answer it's like wow you know those are the things i don't consider because a lot of times what happens is we have an idea of our what of our plans are going to be, and then somebody who's tested these things, they don't really like they they present something like, "Oh, I've never even thought about that." And that's that's what's really the best part about the summit is that people now they got a laboratory to test their tactics, whatever they plan, they thought it was going to work or whatever it is that they get, they get an actual at least a an experience, a safe experience within a controlled environment under the guidance of expert coaches who've been doing this for decades um as far as what what tactic am i going to apply what how am i going to try this out what am i what are my stipulations or or the things i'm going to do how i'm going to carry i get to tr- i actually get to try that out and also get advice from people with multiple views as far as how they would solve that problem Absolutely. Yes. Um, that is also the, that is the experience I had at CAS. Um, you also mentioned earlier, just being able to network and meet people. I still talk to, uh, several 
members of CAS uh, that I met just in classes and teaming up with them um, that I, I just met on a whim. You know, you, they were just like, hey, find a partner. And then I met up with someone random and we hit it off. I mean, it's kind of hard not to get along uh, with anyone there because everyone is there to get better hopefully you know some you get those like little unicorns that come to show you what they know we everyone has those in a class um you know maybe it's a little bit of a spectrum but my experience was that you know everyone was just trying to be better no matter you know what level they were at um and also if you end up attending this or you end attend a similar seminar style training event and you get from it that you do want to start jiu-jitsu or start doing something like Muay Thai to kind of work on like a small niche part of all of that, you could, you could do that. I know people that started Jiu-Jitsu after attending ECQC, like they found that they were so uncomfortable on the ground with another person that they just wanted to get better at that part, like getting comfortable being uncomfortable. But, you know, they also knew because Craig lined it up so well that that's not the end all. There's so much more to it. Um, so yeah, I love that you're instilling that in in your attendees as well. Awesome. Yeah. We want to get, get people figure out like, Hey, what's, what's going to work for me? What is it? Um, and, and where are the people that can find? Cause there's still people who don't know who Craig is and all that stuff. Like not, not, none of us have a million followers or anything like that. We're not like world famous guys or anything. So um, people, there are people out here looking for solutions and they don't really understand who to talk to, or even, even if what they're saying is being, what they're being told is right. And so, so there's a lot of um, apprehensions as far as who to train with and why. And, and I, I understand also from the student perspective that there may be guys that maybe they just don't want to train with. Maybe they, they maybe, or, or maybe there's just someone who speaks to them in a way that this other guy doesn't, and they can learn better from this person. So it's like, how do I, how do, how do I find the right person to train with? And so this is, this is also kind of like a, a, a good audition or for you as a, as a student to figure out like, all right, who's the next guy to, for me to train with as far as like, who is going to take, you know, who's going to solve my problem at least r right now, what are my specific deficiencies and who can I talk to that will fix that? So I, I think, um, I think people get, there's so much more to gain from coming that that is not really uh, um it's not really explicit as far as the the marketing or anything like that but or or maybe maybe not uh understood at first but i, I think um it, it's just it's just hard there's just so much to gain um i think and just coming out and just like i think just knowing that i was like okay this plan works ha having that faith in my plan i think that's really that's that's worth it alone. But then like, there's so much more, I, right? you know, like, like how much shooting are you actually going to do? Uh, Cause most people just, they're not going to, they're not going to put the time and energy into becoming a GM. They're going to kind of like, yeah, I'm pretty good with a pistol and this is boring. So how do I introduce something to at least like stimulate my training program? So now like you have this organic growing of an American, a uniquely American martial art of like, fighting and then having a gun and going shooting and you know what using a knife and all this stuff so it's like it's for for me it just makes everything so much more interesting like i like when i doing uspsa which i love it's a lot of fun but just doing the stuff the the combative stuff fighting with the you know a person who's got skin in the game and uh doing that is just a, it's just a whole lot more fun it's just like it's just so uh it, it's very very um interesting to me I, I can I can really get deep and explore that um, in a way that shooting I can't right. Absolutely, it's almost it's such an uncomfortable feeling because I get this feeling too, even at this level. And I don't mean that shh, I'm not saying I'm at a GM level. I'm not saying I know everything I need to know. I mean, like I have some awesome connections, but I I still get to a place where I'm like shit, like. I am missing this key component and I don't, I don't know where to go next. I actually remember, um, I spoke to Tessa, I think it was Tessa Booth, uh, before I attended CAS and I was just kind of feeling this 
deficiency in my journey. Um, this was around the time I dropped out of medical school and I had finished my master's and I was kind of like just ready to dive into this industry. And I told her, I was like, I don't know what's next. Like I've been doing USPSA. I'm not, I'm not good enough to share tips. You know, I can help people get started. <laughs> you know, I can do that. Um, teach them how to not get DQ'd, all that stuff. So I got to this place where I was like, but I, I'm, I originally started this journey because of my desire to become a more well-rounded civilian when it comes to defending my life and my family's life. So I'm just feeling a little lost. And she was like, oh man, the thing that I do when I'm feeling that way is I go and take a class. And going to CAS was the best thing I could have done. And for those wondering, I know I'm like highly pushing it. I'm not being paid to say this. I was actually introduced to John through Kristen Irwin, um, the healthy buffalo. She's a friend of the pod. She introduced me to John. Um, we had an awesome episode, so if you want more of this, definitely check out part one. I'll link that in the show notes, which are the notes below the title, along with how to sign up for CAS uh, so you can hang out with us uh, in September. But uh, yeah, she introduced me. I was looking for people for the podcast. And then from there, I got to meet Chet, got to meet Matt um, Larson and um, all of the other just incredible people in this space. And it just gave me this sense like you said, this sense of direction um, forward kind of pro just propelled my journey. Um, so if you're in the market for that, again, no matter what skill level, skill level you are at, uh, I do highly recommend this. Speaking of skill levels, what would you say for someone who is a bit more experienced, who maybe is nervous, they won't like get what they need out of this? How do the classes uh, kind of cater towards all skill levels? So let, let's, we'll start with kind of the novice. So the novice is like, it's like, all right, what's, what's the next step? You've gone to the gun range, you've shot at a target. Now, what is, what does that look like as far as taking it to the next step? What is it? What is it, all the stuff like that's kind of the end, right? Is like the gun comes out, you shoot the target, you know, hooray, you're a win. But what about everything else that comes before that? We're like, we don't really, I, I think, um, especially with, in the gun world, right? We're always thinking about the shot timer, the beep, but there's so much time and everything that happens before that beep goes on. Right? There's a lot of conversation. There's a lot of, of victim selection. There's a lot of, of a fight. There's a lot of a struggle that we can't really capture. And, and then, so, so there's like a huge part that's disconnected from that beep that we don't, we don't really get a chance to discover. And I think with the, with the summit, we're able to explore everything to the completion, right? We're able to talk about going from the start of a conversation that goes wrong to now you're in that fist fight. Now that fist fight escalates to where your, your life's in danger and you have to under resistance and pressure, get your firearm out, discharge it. And also making sure that you are compensating for making that you are not launching straight rounds into the public when you layer it that way and you start talking about it that way it's like wow self-defense this is this is a very daunting task and so that that's kind of um that's that's where we're at that we don't get to or that we are actually able to explore now that's what's really really different so that that covers how the novice gets that right they get the okay this is what the whole fight looks like this is what this looks like now the let's talk about the intermediate practitioner somebody who is they've got a little bit of gun stuff but they don't fight or they got a little bit of fighting and but they don't shoot now they get to see the intersection of those two worlds usually what happens is like we've approached training kind of in a in, in a compartmentalized manner where it's like people they have the thing that they like to do they have the thing they're good at and they focus on that and then like we kind of see people exploring like they'll they'll kind of do the blue gun dice game where well they'll toss in a, a dummy gun or they'll try they'll they'll do some retention shooting at speed which is like exactly the wrong thing to do and and it's like but it seems like it is right because when you when you're naive or anything like that it's there are things that in theory sound like this is the right way to do this but then like in practice and you start introducing all those elements that we talked about that the, the beginner gets to experience then you're like oh, okay that was exactly the wrong thing to do like retention from speed that's not that's not that's a uh, incredibly unsafe um it doesn't work that way i can't I can't speed retention shoot 
somebody who's got to draw a gun on me because it's like, okay, hey, have you thought about this person hasn't presented capability, opportunity, intent, and you've just drawn and shot on real quiet? Like, wow, okay, didn't really think about that. Or the martial arts guy who is like, yeah, you think about like, okay, I've got his back and I'm choking him, but he accessed the weapon and he's lodging, you know, uh, he's jamming a knife into my femoral. Like, yeah, I choked him out, but the bleed out that like, makes him the winner, right? So things of that nature, right? So like maybe you also need to know trauma medicine. like, And so we got a trauma medicine block happening this year as well. Um, so just kind of like where all of the different type of training, where they intersect and why all these all these things that like people like you have been pushing onto the audience of like where why they start to make sense. Now people get a tangible experience of like, okay, I really need to know these things. Now, we'll talk about the advanced practitioner now. So the advanced practitioner is a person who is doing these things and they've got students. I mean, you're going to talk to essentially it's like a group of instructors with like 500 years of collective experience of instructing people. So you're going to learn a method of presentation of instructing people that just comes from decades and you know, centuries of practice and you're going to find out like you're going to get a better method as far as like how to teach yourself, how to teach others and how to reach others where they're at. Um, because again, right, usually um, we we have a tendency to overcomplicate things or even speak in a way that is instructor. Instructorship is about me taking the image that's in my mind and putting it inside of yours and it seems like self-explanatory. We think about techniques, but we don't really think about like how to like is like is a, a is a student actually ga gaining or gathering all the information I'm trying to say. Uh, like there is a, a constant thing where people say, oh, it's like drinking out of a fire hose. Right. And that's that's the, to me, that's both a good and bad thing. Right. It's like. You can kind of go through something and maybe gain something. But like if the instructors at CAS, what they've done is that they've given a layered approach to how to teach people. It's like, we'll introduce this concept and then I'll teach you or I'll correct one thing on you without. So what's ever the most egregious thing. So, so you're going to be, as a coach, you're going to learn from other expert coaches, and it's just going to make you so much more of a better coach in terms of delivering your own material to others. Absolutely. It's almost like a mini shadowing course. Like you get to kind of shadow and see how the instruction takes place in a sense. There's so much you can take from it other than just the course material itself, I'm sure. So I went through my own compartmentalized training period, and I, I go through it every now and then because. Truly, in order to give yourself fully, you know, to to one aspect of training, you really do have to invest not only finances. So, like my jujitsu, my jujitsu gym, I know is like one hundred and twenty dollars a month. So I need to get my time out of that. Um, so some months, my training is like very heavily focused on jujitsu. But I mentioned earlier uh, when I was going through my masters, I only did USPSA training. I was investing all of my time and money in USPSA to the point that I remember you know, conceal carrying. And I tried to think back to the last time I drive fired and I, I couldn't remember. I think the next step is honestly, I think it's like, that's almost a question. Like you start asking like, Hey, uh, how do I lose weight? And it's like, most people, they know what they need. They already know what they need. They know they need it. They need to see what, what it looks like to get into this fight, what it looks like to, to, to mitigate damage and to protect themselves. Uh, they know they need to work on better social skills or anything like that, or even just, or de-escalation active. Most of what people need is they, they need contextual application. Like it, it, and it's like, you don't need another shooting course. You, you really don't like most of the time you just, you just don't. And I, I want to see you guys get out here and get active and just, See, putting your plans in actions like, you know, 20 September 20th to the 22nd in Biloxi, Mississippi, we have the Combat Association Summit. Come out, get some contextual application, see where your skills are, get a realistic assessment of yourself. And I, I understand it's kind of 
it gets a little scary because it's like it's like going to the doctor, right? And you're getting a health check and you're you're like you don't you don't know you're getting kind of closer to who you really are. But the other side of that is you get to also get closer to the person you really want to be. And I think when you work on your weaknesses, it just just 10x is all your strengths and just makes all everything you're good at just makes it so much better because now you're you're plugging those holes in your game and now you're able to get to your main plan or whatever that focus is and you just it's going to make it to where maybe you can't beat everybody but at least you can't lose to anybody and and that's just a different kind of power absolutely i love that take on self defense yes contextual application love it Thank you for sharing that. And I hope those listening uh, enjoyed the empowerment from this episode. I know I feel empowered to think about what's next for me. Um, As a content creator, I have to keep myself grounded on like, you know, I still need to go and roll at Jizitsu, um, even if I'm not going to collect content. I need to even have days where I, uh, my buddy's really used to me filming our stuff, but she'll be like, oh, you're not filming today? And I'll be like, nope, I need to just ground myself and like be here, be present. So we all have to do that in one way or another, depending on uh, the life you live, the lifestyle you have. Um, And yeah, I I really love this. So thank you so much, John. This has been awesome. I cannot wait. I already have my Airbnb booked. Um, I'm planning on driving, so I'm going to get to get amped up on the way. I know last year I panicked and I stopped at a 5.11 store and I bought like three pair of 5.11 pants. Um, I... (laughs) I... (laughs) I panicked. I was like, I don't have any pants for this. Um, but now I know how to pack for it. So if you're listening and you sign up and you're, um, especially women, if you're like, I don't know what to wear to this, let me know. I'll send you a packing list. Um, but how exciting. If you're thinking about signing up, check out the show notes. Um, at least just head there. Look at who's going to be there. We have so we. John has so many incredible instructors uh, coming, <laughs> teaching and speaking at the event. So check those instructors out. Um, I'm sure you'll find a few that you know or you've at least heard of to get kind of amped up for the class. And then how does the selection process happen for the class? Like, how do you get uh, assigned to instructors? Yeah, so one week before the event, we're going to send you your wish list and you put it out there. Uh, but uh, that was before. That was last year because we had a very limited space. Um, this year we've got 22,000 square foot facility to, of belonging to American top team. So yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, this year we're going to probably let people are probably going to mostly get what they want. They're mostly going to get. It. Yeah. Absolutely. And of course I knew that, you know, from attending last year, I just wanted, you know, you to explain that to who didn't know. Um, if you're listening and you're like, she should know she went, yes, I know. Um, but anyway, (laughs) no one was thinking that before I said it. Okay. Well, thank you for explaining that. I'm so excited. (laughs) And Auburndale was actually so awesome. I remember telling my family where I was going and they're like, where the hell is this? Um, but it ended up being so much fun. It was like right by the beach and then like all these nice little restaurants. So I'm really excited for this new location in Mississippi. I don't think that I've ever been to Mississippi. So this is a way for me to like travel to a new place as well. Um, I'm super excited personally. Um, and hopefully the listener, I'll get to hang out with you. Um, definitely write in. If you ended up signing up because of this podcast episode, I would love to know. Shoot us an email, sheshieldpod at gmail.com. Um, otherwise, the link to sign up is in the show notes. All right. So for those listening that want exclusive content, we have a Patreon. We're about to revamp that. So just keep that on your mind right now. We're not doing too much with it, but we're about to add some really cool features, uh, some bonus content and whatnot. Uh, For these shorts of the episodes, these highlights, Lisa Hamilton, um, my bestie and a friend of the pod, she is the editor for all of the shorts that you all see on Instagram. Thank you all for following there. Uh, We're also on TikTok, YouTube, of course, with the full video content as well. All resources mentioned are in the show notes, like I mentioned, as well as how to find John on social media. Follow the combatives page. Um, Even if you can't attend this year, just follow along and uh, stay in the know. If you like the podcast, please leave a review. This helps us get found. Um, I cannot believe, again, how many of you have taken the time to submit a review. It means the absolute world to me that you guys care enough to do that. That is insane. Um, 
yeah, anyway, so uh, moving on more serious of a note, if you or anyone you know is a firearms owner experiencing a crisis, look into holdmyguns.org. They are an organization that will connect you with a local gun shop or FFL to store your firearm for you. Whenever you're ready to take it back, it is yours. The link to access their website and to find a storage location partner is in the show notes. Thank you for listening. In the meantime, stay safe and stay vigilant.